That's more like it. How many like drums besides me? Amen. Would you stand with me a second? We've been in this series about battles. And so I want to give you just one little shot in the arm here this morning. How many know worship is a battle? Is a weapon. Your worship is a weapon. Everybody say that. Worship is a weapon. This is not just something we do besides just honoring God, and we should honor God and worship God and all that, but worship is a weapon. In the Old Testament, they would send the worshipers ahead of, ahead of, the, of the, the armies to fight, and they would, part of worship is just declaring victory. Remember the whole part about, about battles in the series that we've in, that we're in, is that David never lost a battle. He's a man after God's heart. God never lost a battle. So if David is a God after God's own heart, I would think you and I should be the same type person. Amen? Yeah. And no matter what battle we face, we're going to win it. Yep. Three of you believe that out of all of you. How many believe that you are going to come out of every battle victorious one way or the other? There's a few of you still lacking. Well, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a boost here. How many remember Muhammad Ali, the boxer? Here we go, and then we'll worship. that she had a close fight with. In this rematch, she got a cut over her eye and a bloody nose. And it looked like halfway through the fight she was going to lose. But she came back and won the fight and knocked the girl out. When the fight was over, they interviewed Layla and said, Layla, you look like you were about to lose that fight. How were you able to come back? She said, I watched my father fight. I watched Muhammad Ali beat Joe Frazier and George Foreman and Sonny Liston. I watched him look like he was going to lose, but then I saw him come back. I watched him, and so then she said this, when I thought about who my daddy was. Do you know who your daddy is? He's the lily of the valley. Do you know who your daddy is? He's the bright and morning star. Do you know who your daddy is? He is alive and well. Put your dukes up and come on and get in the paddle. Muhammad Ali has a daughter. So you don't have to put your dukes up to worship, but how many know it's all right to put your hands up to worship? Amen. I want you to say right now the great I am. He is the great I am. Amen.
there's a time to, for the silent type. My dad always told us when we were kids growing up, it's not the one that makes a lot of noise that you need to worry about sometimes. It's the quiet one. But how many know when you've already won victory, it's all right to go ahead and declare victory? Amen. Just like David did when he went to Goliath. He said, just going to let you know before I get here, I'm fixing to take your head off. So you can prepare yourself to meet Jesus or whatever you need to do. Amen? That's how we need to go at our battles in our life and know no matter what this thing is, what happens to me, I'm going to come out better than I went in. Amen? Amen? How many really believes that? How many came this morning realizing that the Bible says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If you, if you haven't thought about that lately, I just want to remind you of that. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Tell your neighbor, that's where he dwells. If we really think about that and become aware of that, how many of us, we would be more particular about what we allowed in there? Yes. If you really thought you are the place where God dwells, what would you allow in there? What voices would you allow in there? What thoughts would you allow in there? What things would you put in there if you really believe that's where he dwells? Amen. He just checked me on that this week, and I'm just going to pass it on to you. The Bible says that we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. He's omnipresent, but he wants to live and reside in you. Jesus said the kingdom is within us within you so this morning before we get into the message I want to just sing this one song I asked her to sing this song and I want you to just close your eyes you can dim the lights if you would Spencer It'll probably just make people feel a little more comfortable and I want you to see yourself as the sanctuary we're, we're in a sanctuary what we call this but how many know this is just a building it's just a place where we gather but what God really likes is you he really likes you and I, and he wants to be welcomed in that place. And I don't know about you, but I have this hunger recently. He's just begun to stir in my spirit lately, this hunger and desire to be pure and holy and to, to be real careful about what I allow in my mind, what I allow in my body, what I allow in my life. But this morning, as we sing this song, just see yourself as the sanctuary, not this room, but see yourself as the sanctuary. And just ask God with me this morning to prepare us to be that place where he will dwell and where he'll speak, where his word will come forth, and he'll, he'll change and rearrange our life. If you agree with me with that this morning, sing this song. It's just more prepared.
Where are all the kids? Can I ask all the kids that are going to go to kids' church to stand up this morning? Whoa, 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 whoa. Look at them. <laughs> Everybody just, all the kids, stand up. Raise your hand. Raise your hand as high as you can. A mark, set, go. <laughs> Some of them still got their hand up. <laughs> You've taught them well. Get your Bibles and devices out if you would. Whatever you use to get into the Word. I'm excited to share this stuff. Today, how many want to be successful in your life? <laughs> Two of you. <laughs> All right. Elbow the person next to you and say, do you or not? Yeah. Do you or not? Quit looking so grumpy. You got all kinds of potential. Your life's in front of you. Your best days are ahead of you. Have you ever looked up how many people really become successful in their life and what age it was? If you look that up, most people are over 65 before they really hit success. So if you're not over 65, you ought to be jumping up and down right now when we talk about success because it's all in front of you. Come on. You really start getting successful later. You're just warming up right now. Amen. And the rest of you that are over that, well, I'm sorry. I mean, no. <laughs> the rest of you over that, we salute you because we realize that there's a lot of truth in that just by statistics. But how many know God wants you successful at every, every season of your life, every age of your life? Two of you believe that. We're going to have a good day today. I'm not just saying stuff to try to hype you up or warm you up. I'm trying to get you to hook on and pay attention because I really believe God's speaking some stuff to the church right now, and especially our country, um, our church, everything about us right now. And, and, and I, I mentioned this last week about unity. It is the, uh, I believe what the Lord spoke to me um, last week, or, or maybe a little f uh, further back than that, but the, the disunity, there's a spirit of disunity and he hates it. He hates it. Because it's not his will. It's not the way he ever designed anything to work. And so I come against that, whether it's in this house or whether it's in this region, whether it's in our nation right now, and I just declare to you, God's fixing to knock it out. He's fixing to turn the light on it. He's fixing to deal with it. And it's up to us whether or not we want to continue to walk in this fiasco of a mess of chaos in our country, in our marriages, in our church, in our communities, our schools, or whatever it is, our health. It's up to us whether or not we want to stay in it or not. But God's going to speak into it. How many believe that? Battle series. We've, we've walked through some of the battles of David's life, and we can see ourselves in these examples. And the intent um, of this is to clean up or to give some understanding and some wisdom to us about God, about David, and ultimately affect us as we deal with our own lives and battles. That's what this is about. That's why I preach. As we went through some of these uh, these battles and these things, God began to speak to me about the subject of unity and not only in David's life, but how powerful it really is. And so we started just a little bit last week on the subject of unity. And I want to talk to you again for a few minutes on the topic of unity. Everybody say unity. Unity is a very powerful thing. Let's pray. Father, as we get into your word today, I pray they don't hear you. I pray they, hear, they, they don't hear me. They hear you. See, even in my foolish prayer, you're still here. God, I thank you that, that you spoke this to us. And it's not an accident of where we are today, where we're sitting, what we're listening to. You said our steps are ordered. It's not an accident that you came on me by your spirit in a most unusual place and time. When I was crying out to you, asking you what needs to be done and what I can do to fix it, and you began to speak this to me. And so I boldly confess and declare your word this morning. I thank you, Father, that no matter what's going on in our lives personally, in our relationships, our church, our community, our country, 
that you're still God. You're above it all. You're not afraid of it. You're not mad at us or anything else. You just want to do like you did in the beginning and step out in the middle of chaos and begin to declare order and set this thing up to function in the right way. I thank you that you're doing that. I welcome your word. I welcome your word that says, let there be. And I pray that that permeate in this house today. I thank you for your presence that I feel so strong right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to start at the top. I'm going to read through the whole chapter, so, so hook on and, and just read with me, okay? Because there's purpose in all of this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everybody say both. The earth was without form and void means chaos. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering right over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided. Everybody say divided. Huh. The light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. The evening and the morning were the first day. Let's just keep rolling. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. In other words, the waters on the earth to the waters above. Basically, clouds. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seeds, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree yields fruit, and whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle, creeping things, beasts of the earth, which all, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and the water, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Tell your neighbor you have dominion. It's up to you whether you take it or not. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female. Back up, please. One screen. 
So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female, say two. That's all he said. He created them. Go ahead. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you. It shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was good, or it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. I want to stop right there and get into this. I was reading this in the uh, NIV translation, and it uses the word divided several times where God was creating something. He divided this from this, and he divided this from this. And, then, and so I wanted to read this to set up the beginning portion of this unity series or part of this series. Did you, the, one of the constant threads in this, especially in the NIV version, if you had that, you would have seen the word divided several times there. God steps out into the darkness, the chaos, and nothing, and he begins to set things in order. He first creates, then he divides what he created into its proper place or position, and then he causes it to all work together. Do you see that in creation? He creates it, he separates what needs to be separated, but then it all works together. Everybody say, it all works together for the good. We could stop right there and go home as far as I'm concerned. That's a whole sermon by itself. God will separate some things, but he'll also make them all work together for good. Because I'm going to talk about unity, but I'm going to also show you several places where God divided a lot of things. But if God divides something and there's division that God has, it's for a reason and a purpose and it's all going to work together for good. So don't get hung up and too super religious or spiritual on me or wordy about one or two verses because I can show you ten more where God divides. And Jesus said, I didn't come to do all that and put it all together. I came to divide. I came to break up some stuff. Better say break up. Yeah. Where are you going, Pastor? Hang on. Psalms 133. It's not going to be this week. They're just going to wait off in it this week, and we'll go a few more weeks. Psalms chapter 133. Because we're on unity. Remember that. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, the high priest. Because that's the only example they had in that time when the psalmist was writing this about Aaron and the priesthood of God and how the, the orderliness of God. It's running down the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing life evermore. I want you to just pay real close attention to this last line. I'm going, to, I'm going to go really slow today. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Where does God command blessing? Unity. Where there's unity. That's where he commands blessing, even life evermore. How many would like everything you do to be life? To be life evermore. Life evermore doesn't start when you die. Life evermore starts when you're born. Life evermore starts when you wake up and you realize how good God is and what he really did for you. And now everything in my life is life. No matter what I go through, no matter what separation, no matter what breakups, plowing my field, whatever he does in my life, whatever is going on, it's for my good, and he wants to bless me and give me life evermore. But there is one thing that has to be in order for it to be commanded there, and that is unity. First with him, 
and then with whatever else he leads us to. But it's a principle about unity and the power of unity. Some of you might have heard this if you're Dave Ramsey fans or followers or do the Dave Ramsey stuff. But he tells a story that Zig Ziglar told a lot. If you, some of you older people know Zig Ziglar probably more than the younger ones, but he was a motivational speaker and, and things. But he, he told the story of how, you know, in rural areas, and we're familiar with that, a lot of places they have uh, tractor pools and things during their county fair time. We do it here in Smith Center. But in, in some places they have pools with horses. And they use big Belgian horses or work horses like the Budweiser horses and, and, and things like that. And they use them to pull and they have pulling contests. And on average, he told this, he told this the average Belgian horse pulls about 8,000 pounds alone. But if you hook up two of those horses, two Belgian horses, don't have to be related, un, just go get another one and hook them up together, how many pounds do you think they pull? I mean, I would think 16,000, but it's 24,000. So we went from 8,000, and when you hook two together, you go to 24,000. But an interesting fact about that is, is you can take, those are just unrelated horses, just somebody brought their horse and hooked on another one. But if you take two horses that are related to each other, that grew up on the same farm, under the same trainer, the same ownership, the same feed relative to each other, and you hook those two together, what do you think they pull? 36,000 pounds. So there's something about being in unity and being in one accord and, and, and being together on things, not just coming together, that's powerful. And it increased with the horses from 8,000 to 24,000. But if you'll take two of them that actually grew up together and have a whole lot more things in common, come on. It's way more powerful. Tell your neighbor there's power in unity. Unity is powerful. A matter of fact, Genesis chapter 11, you'll know this story. Most of you, Genesis chapter 11, the whole earth had one language and one speech. Sounds like unity. The whole earth had one language and one speech. This is where I believe before all the languages ever even began. This is the story where I believe they came from in, in the country, in the world. And it came to pass that as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city. Because how many know, as soon as people begin to come together... It's automatic we want to build something. We want to create. When you get a young man and a young woman together, how many know you don't have to do much? Just get them together for a while, and they'll start just automatically wanting to create something. Come on. Don't get all hooty-tooty on me. Hoity-toity. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. We want to go higher. We want to build. We want to do things when we come together. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. And now nothing... Everybody say nothing. They all have... They are one, and they have one language, and now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Tell your neighbor, that's powerful. If we could get on the same page, speaking the same language, what would be impossible? According to God and His Scripture. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And you're like, wait a minute, God. I thought the whole goal was for us to get to heaven. They're trying to build a tower, and they're going to build their way to heaven, and you're going to stop it. That's too deep to get into today. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. And therefore, its name is called Babel. Blah, 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 blah. Because 
There the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. How many know God did never, never wanted us to build our way to heaven? He never wanted us to become unified to get to heaven or to build something to make us look great or anything about that. He, wanted, he confused that. As a matter of fact, he just scattered them and gave them different languages so they couldn't do it. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Is that, I just give you nine. That's fine. The Tower of Babel. There is nothing that they cannot do when they're in unity. You say, well, pastor, what is the goal here? I thought God wanted unity. Stay with me and pay attention to what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm not talking about getting to heaven, because that never was the goal. The goal was to get heaven to operate on earth. The goal is not to get you from here to there. The goal is to get there here. That's why he told his disciples, this is how you pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth like it is in heaven. He doesn't need us in heaven. He needs us here. Amen? He needs us here to establish the kingdom, the way life works in heaven, and the way things work in heaven. He wants us to establish it here, and we do need unity to do that here. But there is a spirit, I believe this with everything in me, there is a spirit of disunity. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. It used to be we trusted the news. And for good reason, we don't trust the news anymore. I'm not, I'm not trying to beat you up, okay? So get off of me a little bit. There's a reason, because they were crooked. They had agendas of whatever they were. Sorry, I'll stay centered a little better. Home. Um, but nobody trusts anybody. People don't trust authority anymore. Why? Because of the abuse of authority. From parents, bad parents, bad dads, bad moms, stuff happens to people and they get hurt, they get abused, they get, something happens, and so now they have this hurt and this scar that's never been healed, and so now they resist authority, so therefore it just continues the disunity. I'm sorry it happened, but we need to get healed. So it doesn't continue and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But what's happened is we have let the unhealed just keep spreading and spreading and spreading. And we've promoted disunity and rebellion to the point in this nation and in this world that no one trusts anybody. And there's all this disunity everywhere. And it's in the church. It's in our families. It's in our businesses. It's in all kinds of things because no one wants to trust anybody. And I'm not saying that it's easy to trust people. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> You try to get something done nowadays, how, how easy is it to get it done? It used to be you just take your car, drop it off, they'd fix it, you knew it. They were professional, they were trained, they were certified mechanics, they would fix your car or your tractor or your horse, a shoe your horse, whatever it was. They would just fix it. And now, I don't know if you're like me, when I drop something off, I wonder. Yeah. When I pick it up, is it going to be fixed? Is it going to be right? Did they finish tightening all the bolts? I bought a piece of equipment yesterday, took it out to use it, and fired it up, and it just starts rattling and coming apart. Somebody had got it out of the box and put it together and just finger tightened a bunch of stuff on it and said, there you go. It's ready to go. So we have to stop what we were doing and reconstruct it and tighten everything down and get it all put together so it'll work properly. And so I, how many are frustrated with that? It's like you order something, and then you've got to call back three times to make sure they got it, they went ahead and did it, they went ahead and finished it, and then they shipped it. And then you have to track your shipping to make sure it gets to you. I don't know about you, but I grew up in the days when you ordered something, it was coming. You could order a whole house from Sears and Roebuck, a lumber pack with the windows and the doors and the shingles and the, all the wood, the nails, everything. You just order the whole thing, and it just come to your house. <laughs> semis pull in they'd unload it may take six months but he'd get there but we and so this this mentality and this understanding is so prevalent in our society today and if we don't get a hold of it or do something with it it's just going to continue to be chaos and so uh, there has to be a solution right 
There has to be a solution. When we're having trouble in our lives, in our relationships with people or our businesses or whatever it is, and it's chaotic and things are just crazy and uh, we got exes fighting with us about something or we've got coworkers that we can't get along with. or we, all the, It's like chaos. It's like, how do we bring this? How do we stop this? You can't just fire everybody. I remember the manager at the company I worked with when I was young. He called me in the office one day, and we were talking about some of the guys and some of the problems in the company, and I was just a young man. And he said, Mike, he said, what do you get if you fire the worst guy out there? He said, which guy out there is the worst one? And I said, well, I know who I think it is, because, you know, young people always have a big opinion. And so I said, well, I know who it is. Nothing against young people. I love you, all of you. But the facts are the facts. We all, I'm not who I used to be, thankfully, and I'm embarrassed of what I used to be. Um, he said, if you fire the worst person that you have, what do you have left? And I, he said, the next worst person. So let's just fire him too, right? And I said, well, might as well clean house. Because that's how I was thinking as a young man. He said, then what? I said, well, we have less people. He said, then we get less done, right? And he said, if we just keep doing that, who's going to be here? I said, me and you. <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> he said, you wouldn't get anything done, so what's the solution? And I said, I don't know. And he said, unity. I said, I don't know how to do that. And he said, it's tricky. You've got morale at a workplace. You've got morale at things like that when you have a group of people together, and you've got to keep the morale up, and you've got to watch out for the poison that's being planted and inserted in places. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the worm that gets in your alfalfa field. It's the, the bug that gets in your corn. It's the, whatever gets in your crop and whatever you're trying to do, whatever you're trying to produce, it's just that little one that gets in there. And you leave it alone long enough and you don't deal with it. It just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Next thing you know, it starts eating the whole harvest. We were moving cows recently. And I, I believe there's two philosophies on moving cattle it's my opinion. You can agree or disagree. You can either lead them or you can drive them. You can get a bunch of people and drive them and make them go where you want them to go. Or you can get them taught to where they'll follow your voice or a feed bag or a cube bag or whatever it is, a, a bale on the back of a truck, and they'll just follow you. And one person can put a bale on the back of a truck and just go, and when you have them trained to follow, and they'll just follow or shape a, shake a cube bag. And if you're a person that doesn't have a lot of help available, you learn that quickly. Because when you try to chase them and you don't have enough help, how many know it gets chaotic pretty quick? Anybody ever drive cows with not enough help? One of the worst fights my family ever had was trying to move my cows across the road from my house, just across the road in a gate. And it was just me and Cassie and Austin. <laughs> and it was a train wreck. Because we were going to lead them and drive them. And then we had miscommunication. And it went really bad. And I'll just leave that alone. Sorry, Austin. But so you can either drive that. And so the other day, we, my cows are pretty much broke to lead. But I have one or two that are idiots. I had. Had. One or two that were idiots. And so we got the bail bed, and we had one guy on that, and I had a lot of good help. I had four guys show up, and we had horses, three horses, and a bail bed, and it's like, we're going to do it all. We're going to lead them, and then we're going to drive them. And this is going to be smooth. Had all the corrals set up, fence set up, and everything's ready to go. And here we go. Bail bed comes out, honks the horn. Here comes all the cows. It's going great. Of course, they all got baby calves on them now, so that's like herding chickens. And so we start across the field. And we get the three horses and we go around and they all start moving and go in the same direction. I'm thinking, I just leaned back on my horse and I thought, man, this is the life. And about that time, two of them went left and they started away. And they start, and so then we have to chase them with the horses and then the others say, hey, somebody's leaving. Where are we going? Hey, maybe we should go over here. Maybe we shouldn't go with everybody else. Maybe we ought to go over here. I mean, why would we want to go in a crowd anyway? And what they didn't realize is me as their shepherd or as their rancher, I'm trying to get them all together in one place, yes, so I can move them to greener pasture. So I can help them 
live more healthy lives and to grow their calves and to produce what they are called to do. And I'm, that's my goal. But when they start trying, you get one or two that goes off like that. And so then we have one that, I mean, she's an idiot because I don't want to cuss. And she takes off like a mile on the run. And so my son-in-law was there, and he takes off, and we have to get the horses back. And we, and we, so we go around them two or four times, and we're circling, and it's all ranchy, real big there for a while. We, though that you, those of you that know what ranchy means, it gets a little wild for quite a while. Horses are soaking wet with sweat, lathered up, and we get them all shoved in the corral except those two, basically. And so we go, and we have to go across the river, way out in the neighbor's wheat field, and then into the trees, and then she'd get behind a brush pile, and she'd go this way, and that way. you try to go this way, and she'd go that way, and then you go back around, and she'd go back, and just stand there and look at you. You'll lose your Sunday school lesson. I don't care how spiritual you are. After a while, your horse can't hardly breathe, and she's sitting over there going... And so I go down there and help him, and we eventually we get her back. My point is, when you're trying to lead a whole herd, or you're trying to lead something in a direction to get it better, once in a while you'll have one that's rebellious. And you say, well, Jesus left the 99. We'll get to that in a minute. And you have to pull off, and you have to ride. Horses, to me, are always symbolic of strength. In Scripture, And so you have to use all this strength to go after this rebellious thing. And you work and you fight and you work and you're trying to get something that's rebellious that doesn't want to be part of the herd, that doesn't want to be unified. And you spend all this energy and strength trying to get it back where if you didn't have to spend all that energy, look how smooth things would go. And then when you get back and you finally get that one rebellious person, per, cow, sheep, whatever it is, into that place, and if anything else happens, you're exhausted. You have no more strength to keep fighting. Why? Because of that rebellious spirit, because of that division, not wanting to go. And it's, and it's just it's, it's the principle of it. Do you see this? Does this make sense? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not. See, Jesus, God never wanted to drive us into anything. God wanted to lead us. The Holy Spirit leads you and guides you into all truth. And what does truth do? Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if God, that's how God operates. How many know that's how he wants to operate in your life and my life? And that's how he wants us to do. Lead us and guide us into all truth. He doesn't want to drive us. He doesn't want to force us into doing anything. That's why he gave us a free will from the garden. And he said, all I'm asking you to do is don't eat from the knowledge of good and evil tree. You don't need to know good or evil. See, everybody gets hung up on that like it was all bad. And I shared a clip. Robert Morris was, was preaching on this. He's going down some really good stuff and about this, that God not only didn't want them to know evil, but he didn't want them to know good either. He wanted us to know him. Because when you and I, he knows you and I can't handle knowing good and evil. We need to let him be the good shepherd. We need to let him lead us and guide us into all truth. We need to let him lead and guide our lives and instruct us and tell us where to go and, and what we need to do because he's a good father. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He won't abuse you. He won't hurt you. He will guide you, and he wants what's better for you. He wants you to have greener grass. David said, or the psalmist said, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I won't lack anything. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He, he leads me in green pastures. That's his goal for you and me. That's his goal for this church. That's his goal for this country. That's his goal for your business, for your marriage, for your children. His goal is to lead you to greener pastures and keep letting you become the fullness of everything that he created you to be and produce. Did you notice in there everything reproduced after its own kind? Everything had dominion and multiply. The man had dominion and multiply. Every bird, every animal, every fish. It said multiply, reproduce, replenish. That's what he wants to do. 
That's what God wants for you and I. Remember that. And so here's where I want to start preaching today. That was introduction. I'm not sure of all the ways to build unity. I'm, I'm just not. When God began to deal with me about this a week or two ago, I said, God, I don't know how to build unity. If I did, I would have built it already. Can I just be that honest? That's like, I don't know how to make people love each other. You can't make people love. Only God can do that. Only you and I can decide to love. Love's not a feeling. Love's a decision. I said, love's not a feeling. Love is a decision. For God so loved the world that he gave. And it has action with it. Love gives. Love moves. Love, does, love has action as well. But I said, I'm not sure of the ways to build that or to build everything to do with unity. But I do know it's what you dealt with me about, God, and I do know that that's what in a country, a community, a church, a family, etc., that's your goal. How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. That is where God commands the blessing. And the blessing does not mean stuff. Please hear me. Blessing means happiness, joy, the fullness of life. But there is such a spirit of disunity and he wants it out and so do you. You really do. It feels good to be rebellious. It feels good to fight. It feels good to get even. It feels good to tell somebody off sometimes. But it doesn't fix anything. Well, you're all quiet now. So, <laughs> but it doesn't fix it. And we need to get rid of that disunity in our lives. Individually with us and God, whatever is coming between God and us, whatever is becoming between God and our spouses, us and our spouses, our children. And you say, Pastor, how to do that? I'm not sure how to do it all, but I know in the next few weeks we're going to get into some stuff that I think will help us all. Because I'm asking. I need it in my marriage. I need it in this place. We need it in our country. I said this last week. We used to be the United States of America. United we stand, divided we fall. Any kingdom divided against itself will surely fail, the Bible says. If you're divided against yourself, isn't it amazing that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword dividing. See, here's that dividing again in a good way. And we're going we're gonna to take the time to get into that in the, in, the, in the future. Dividing asunder between what? Soul and spirit. And you say, well, if our soul's the problem all the time, our mind, will, and emotion, why did God give us a soul? Because he wants them to all work together. But there's times and there has to be something that divides between which is which. There has to be something in our life that divides between my spirit man and my feelings. To what is true versus what I, I think might be happening. What is fact and what is somebody telling me or trying to mislead me. I need that discerning voice. I need that Holy Spirit in my life to lead and guide me unto all truth. Are you with me so far? We need that out of our lives. So when a farmer plants a field, the first thing they do is what? Typically... They plow, they break it up, right? You used to plow it, then disc it, and then we spray it and plant it. Is that right? Close? Why? Why? To prepare the soil to do what? The Bible says from dirt you came and from dirt you, God puts seed in what? You and me. What's he want to do with it? Grow a harvest. He wants to produce something in the earth. And he chose to do it through people, through us. And so just like a farmer, you break up that ground. You, you tear, it all, tear it all up. You flip it over upside down. You plow it. You disc it. You break it all up smoother and smoother. And then you spray it, etc. Not only to prepare that soil, but to make sure that things that were growing... 
or that would steal or take away from what he intends to grow will not be there or will be uprooted and sprayed and killed. That's why they do that, right? That's why God does it in our life. That's what God wants to do. Weeds. We don't want weeds in our life. We don't want weeds in our field. Why? Because they steal moisture. They, they shade out the other crops. They ruin the value of the seeds that we're trying to produce as farmers. If you've got a bunch of weeds in your field and you go harvest that and you've got a bunch of weed, what does it do to the value of the seed? It lessens it, right? They dock you. God has the same thing. He is, his word is the seed, and he wants to put that in us, but he doesn't want to compete with a bunch of weeds because it devalues the seed. I long for the day where there's a hunger for righteousness instead of such a hunger to get away with everything we can. To where we realize, and I don't mean this to be mean and harsh, I, people just don't understand how good God is. They don't understand all the good that he has for us. And that's why they rebel from it. And they're like, I'm not going to submit. I'm not going to unify. I'm not going to do that. Well, go ahead. But you're the one that's going to suffer. And I don't mean that mean. If, you could, if we could ever figure out a way to get it across to people of how good God really is and what he really wants to do in your marriage, what he really wants to do in your life, what he really wants to do through you in this life, it gives you purpose and vision and direction. And you, you have something to live for other than to just get a bunch of stuff or try to prove somebody wrong that said you'd never amount to anything. Or get even with somebody. He gives you a whole purpose and realize that God's wanting to grow something in your life. He's wanting to produce through you and I. You don't want that crap in your field. Neither do we. So here's a few things that destroy unity. Because the first thing you have to do is break it up, right? You have to turn some stuff over. That's why you hear me say sometimes when I'm praying, God, open us up like a plowed field. I don't just pray that because it's cute. I pray that because that's what he, he, he put in my spirit. Break me up. Break up the hard ground in my life. Break up the hard flesh in me. Break up what's been allowed to grow in my life. Turn it over. Turn it upside down. Disc it. Break it up. Whatever you need to do. Kill the weeds and then put your seed in there so it will grow. So we have to, to me, before you can really put a bunch of structure into building something or creating unity, you need to first get rid of whatever's causing disunity. Amen? I don't know. So there are a few things that I believe that we could deal with or become aware of that kill unity. And I think it would be really good if we would get rid of the things that cause disunity as a starting point to create and grow unity. Would that make sense? just like a plow in a field. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn everything upside down and we're going to get rid of everything that was not growing what we want. Is that fair? In your relationship with God, number one, always. Your relationship with your family, number two, always. And then your relationship at church, your business, everything else that you do. Because you have to get it in order, right? God's got to be first, family second, and then everything else. You get it out of order, you start getting chaos again. Things start having problems. So I want to deal with five things real quick before we go today that destroy unity. Okay? If you're taking notes, write these down. Number one, poor communication. We live in an information age but I believe we're starving for a communication age. And please don't get all uptight. But we're almost back to drawing symbols on the walls of caves again. 
in our communication skills. If you go back and read people 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, their vocabularies and their word structure and their, their, their sentence structure and the way they spoke was eloquent. They were educated. True education just keeps being on a decline and the communication comes along with it because we live in such a text society. It's just a text. And depending on what asterisks or what emojis or what you put with it or whether you capitalize or don't capitalize, that's how we're, we're trying to communicate. I'm almost to the point where I want to eliminate texting from my phone. You know how many fights that I get into with people because of text or people misunderstand me? Because I'm not real good either. I'm not real wordy. And so, and I text fast, and I have fat thumbs, and I don't reread my text sometimes before I send them. My fault. Everybody say, poor communication skills. Whether we're texting or whether we're talking. And so it comes out wrong. And then people get offended. And then we divide. So hopefully, if I'm texting you, you know my heart. So if I say something to you that seems a little hard or off course, just know my heart, okay? Poor communication or lack of communication. How many know you got to talk about it? You have to communicate with people. Not everybody knows what you're thinking. I'm not going to say husbands or wives here. We're not mind readers. Nobody is. You have to communicate how you think, what you want to be done. And I'm not the best at that, and I haven't been. I just assume if somebody's doing something with me, they know what I'm thinking. And that doesn't work. And if any of you have ever worked for me, keep your hands down or with me. You know. We were working cows when I was a kid one time. And I was running the gate, and my dad was telling me, to keep them or let them go. Keep them or let them go. You're sorting. In, out, in, out. Anybody ever do that? And he said, out. I let him out. And he started yelling. I said, you said out. He said, not what I said, what I meant. I said, how am I supposed to know what you meant? If what you said, which one am I supposed to obey? I'm not a mind reader. Of course, we laughed finally. Took him longer to laugh than us. My brother and I busted out pretty quick, but poor communication. If we don't communicate, we don't have unity. Number two, unresolved disagreements. This is a biggie. Because people get offended or mad about something and then they just separate. Or they don't talk about it. Or if if we get offended by something with someone and we don't talk about it, or we don't work it out, how many know that causes disunity? I deal with it a lot as a pastor because I make people mad a lot, either with what I preach or what they think somebody said, I believe or said, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People would rather believe what somebody else said than ask me themselves and be mad at me over it, even though they never knew whether I said it or not, or believed it, or what we think, or what we preach here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you never, if you never resolve the disagreement or talk about it, it keeps the disunity. If I make you mad while I'm preaching, Heather, and you don't tell me, do we, is that cause unity? It causes disunity. But if you go out and tell five people how mad you got... See what it did? It just spreads like a weed. Somewhere else, somewhere else, somewhere else. And it will never get better. It just continues to get worse. And you say, well, if you made somebody mad, Pastor, you're supposed to go to them. No, that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says if you are offended, you are to go to the one and talk about it. Mm Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of times that I might offend somebody as a pastor or whatever, and I don't even know it. And they just quit, leave, go. 
It works that way when you run a business. Somebody gets mad and they quit or whatever. They, they, or they think you thought or said something and that they don't resolve the disagreement. I encourage you today, resolve. Go talk about it. And you say, you don't know my family. I understand there's situations, and I look across this room, and I know situations that going and talking about it ain't going to fix it. There are times of that. I, I agree. I understand that. I've had instances with people in my life where going to talk to them was not going to fix it because they were mad they were done. So you just go on. You forgive and let God deal with them, right? You resolve it. You can resolve it within yourself even though they don't. You can attempt to fix it. You can attempt to, and, and however many times you need to, that's fine. That's between you and God. But if they won't, you can't fix that. And so all is you responsible for is you resolving it within yourself. I've done what I could do. Let the chips fall. How many can feel freedom in that? It's like, all right, I'm good. I tried to talk. They don't want to talk. I'm going on. Number three, lack of shared purpose. When there's not shared purpose, and this is mainly like for companies, churches, groups like that, some of these, but it'll apply all the way around. Lack of shared purpose. When a husband and a wife are in agreement with what they're going to do, it is very powerful. And I mentioned this last week, just because you go along with something doesn't mean you're in agreement. And there's a difference between being in agreement and unity. And we talked about that last week. I know people that have went along with people, but they weren't in agreement. And I know people that said they agreed, but they really didn't agree in their heart. They're like, fine, we'll do it. I'm with you. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, that's not the right tone if you're with me. If you're with me, it's like, yes, let's do it. Amen? I've got your back, you've got my back. That's unity. There's a difference. And so lack of shared purpose. If you have shared purpose and you're both on the same page and you say, well, I just can't with my spouse or I just can't with this coworker. I, I can't. Well, there's so many things to get into with this. We don't have time. You do what you can do on the unresolved disagreements. And then you have to settle it within yourself and resolve it with yourself. Number three, lack of shared purpose. You need the shared purpose. When you're both on the same page, you're both going the same direction, and you both have the same goal, or a group all have the same goal, how many know it's powerful? If I put it into a company situation, if you're, if you're making a product and you're trying to sell a product, the whole goal is to create the product, right? Right? And to sell the product, a good product, and customer service. So anybody that's not on the same page with that is not in unity with you. And you want that. You want that shared purpose. We're all doing this together. What's the goal? To, because we're, we're creating something. We're, we're, we're doing something in that way. If you're in a church, what is the shared purpose of the church? To advance the kingdom. And I had to check myself, and, and, and I'm going to be totally transparent with all this. I don't know that I'm that good of making the vision clear. Because people say, you've got to have a vision. And we've got to know what the vision is of the church. We've got to know what the direction of the church is. And that preach is good, and it sounds pretty good. But I thought everybody knew we were all about the same thing. The kingdom of God. His kingdom coming to our, establishing his kingdom principles in our lives. Our whole goal as a church, my goal as a pastor is to get people to believe, have a relationship with God, Holy Spirit themselves, so where they can feed themselves, hear his voice, he leads them and guides them, but we all work together to continue to spread that to other people. And we come together every week to build each other up and encourage one another and to, to teach our children and to have community and to spur one another on in our faith. And if we have a need, we help meet the needs with other people by coming together and finding out those needs, et cetera, et cetera. It's just kind of all that one thing. But if I need to define it down more, I'm going to work on that. And I, I plan to do that because I think we're going to do some restructure here. And so you, you, have to, you have to make it clear where you're going and what you're doing so everyone else can have the shared purpose or vision. Number four thing to 
disrupt unity or cause disunity is gossip. How many of you know gossip is like a weed? We used to, anybody watch Veggie Tales with your kids? Remember the rumor weed and how it just kept growing and growing and growing? Don't get involved in gossip. If you weren't there and saw it yourself or heard it yourself, you don't know. And even if you did, are you supposed to spread it? No. You're supposed to cover it. You're supposed to not expose it. You're supposed to pray for those people and encourage those people, not spread the gossip. Not continue to get involved in that. Well, I heard so-and-so did this. You heard? That's how I'm going to respond to everybody from now on. You what? Were you there? Did you see them having sex? Did you hear them say it? Did they screw you over? Was it you or did you hear they did it? Because if you heard it, well, I know them. No, you don't. Let's just eliminate any opportunity for offense. Let's eliminate anything that would cause disunity. Let's just step aside from that. Let's not talk about that anymore. I know this is hard, but it's the truth. And if we don't, somebody doesn't stand up and start speaking to the problem and dealing with the issue, it's going to just get worse. The reason things have gotten so bad is because nobody said anything and nobody got involved in anything that we do. Whether it's our... Nah... Number five, sanctioned incompetence. In other words, allowed incompetence. Allowed, when we allow people to be wrong, when we allow people to do a, a halfway job, when we allow people to just be lazy, we allow people to... To, to not be righteous, when we allow people, our, our start with ourselves, when we just put up with stuff and just let it go and let it go and let it go and not just confront it. I'm not saying we need to be our brother's judge. I'm just saying we need to call, call out some stuff sometimes instead of putting up with it and deal with it. Everybody say deal with it. When you don't deal with it, it will only get worse if you don't stop it. A week or so ago, I... I Anybody ever step on a sandbar? I had a little piece of a sandbar break off in my heel. And you step on it, you know, and it hurts for a couple days, and you think, well, it's just, it'll go away. Well, this just kept getting worse and worse. That piece that we finally dug out of my heel last night was so small, we could barely even see it. Just this little bitty piece of something. I say it was a sandbar. I don't know if it was for sure. It was a rumor. I thought it might have been a sandbar. So I told you, sandbar. This little bitty piece in the bottom of my foot left undealt with and allowed to be in a place it's not supposed to be began to fester and began to hurt. Then it began to get infected then it affected my walk. Then it affected my attitude. You know how big it was to start with? That's why you deal with it. And you say, well, they didn't mean it. I know they didn't mean it. But if it bothered you, just go talk to them. Don't be a baby in a wine bag about everything because we got a, the offense level is way up here now too. Everybody's offended over everything. I'm not going that route. What I'm saying is... <laughs> what I'm trying to say is deal with it. Don't let it fester. I had a guy come to me one time. We had been involved with him in ministry, and he came to me like three years later. I didn't even know that I said something or did something. And this poor kid was living in turmoil because he was so mad at me. I didn't even know it. And he came to me at this, we were at the same place one time, we ended up at the same place, and he came to me and he said, I just want you to know I forgive you. I said, okay. For what? Well, you did this and this. And I said, I didn't even know I did that. But I said, man, I'm sorry. If you'd have told me three years ago, I'd have told you I'm sorry three years ago. 
And he said, well, this just caused me a lot of pain and a lot of problems. I said, I'm really sorry for you. Because I didn't even know. But if, see, if he had dealt with it. See, if somebody offends you, go to them and say, listen, that, that bothers me. This feels like it's landing like, going over like a pregnant high jumper. And maybe it is because there's such an attitude of disunity and everybody's got so used to it, they just like it. Or they, 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 we just think that's how it is. Tell your neighbor that doesn't have to be this way. This country does not have to be this way. Your school does not have to be that way. Your teachers do not have to be allowed to be that way of your children. The corruption in your city does not have to be that way. Right? The corruption in your home does not have to be that way. We are the solution to the problem. God put us here. God planted us here. And he said, I put my word in you. I, I planted my plan and purpose in people. And I want this thing to grow and continue to replenish the earth, not make it get back to chaos. And so my challenge for you, I'm going to leave you with a challenge and we'll quit. My challenge for you this week is try to eliminate the things that are causing disunity. Just snide comments. We have a rule in our house. It's the second thing that you say that gets you in trouble. Like my wife will answer, ask me something and I'll say something and then I'll have a little snide comment after that. That's what gets us in trouble. When she does that to me, it's like flicking me on the ear. I hate that, by the way. Just that right there could make less disunity. Wait a minute. I think that's a, that's a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Self-control. I don't have to say anything snide. Right? Very simple, very small little something. Stick her in your heel. But if you leave it alone and don't deal with it, it festers. And it'll affect your whole walk and your attitude. Because every time you take a step, oh, I'm mad because it hurts. Nobody else knows the hurts there. That's why we're so big on getting inner healing in people. Hurts deep within your heart that happened a long time ago in your life that you've never allowed God to heal and you don't understand why you're so angry all the time. You don't understand why you have such an attitude. You don't understand why you fight addiction so bad. You don't understand why I struggle with it. There's a reason for everything. And there's a solution for it. And that's the part that I think we have lulled ourselves to sleep with in this country and society that that's just the way we are. Everybody's got 14 anxiety problems. Everybody's got this thing, this illness, this thing. This. We didn't used to. You say, yes, we did. Nobody knew about it. Nobody talked about it. No. I grew up just one generation ago. And nothing was like this. In school. Was there some bullying? Yeah, but we dealt with it. Was there some abuse? Yeah. But it usually got dealt with quickly. I had a teacher kick me down the stairs one time. Third grader. Took me out in the hall because I did one of them -ing 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 comments. Took me out in the hall. And we were getting ready to go down the stairs. And he had me by the back of the shirt and kicked me in the hind end. And I fell clear down the stairs. My parents would have owned that school nowadays. Not in my house. See? Got dealt with. Was it wrong? Yeah. But who was wrong first? Nye, nye, nye. So that's hard. No, it's real. I'm tired of just like trying to do church and it's like what's the whole goal here what are we doing I want to solve problems 
I think life's meant to live and enjoy and accomplish and grow and produce and be the solution for people. Love God, love people. That's all we are. That, that's who we are. So in case anybody tells you or you hear rumors about Cassie and I or this church, that's all we are. I tell people all the time, I'm as plain as a pocket on a shirt. I'm kind of handy to have once in a while, but I don't look that great. It's not real fancy. I don't know how else to say it. I, I mean that. That's a, I love people. I like to see people grow and get better. I like to help people. I'm an encourager. I'm an exhorter. I like to see people grow in a business or get successful at what they do and, and be happy, but I want them to be whole. I was praying this week and just in my quiet time, I was washing out a cattle trailer, by the way. I got a whole sermon series on crap. If you leave it too long, it's really hard to get it off there. You got to have a pressure washer and hot water and broom. And it takes so long. But if you get the crap out right after you get it in there, don't get under condemnation if your trailer is the one I was washing out. It's the principle. But I really believe, and I, I'm being total transparent here. I really believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and He said, I never called you to speak to the nations. Because some of my frustration is, I've, I've tried to make things grow, and, and I want to see, be, you know, we could do this, and we could do that. And I got a lot of vision, and, and I see how things could happen. And then I get frustrated when people can't get a hold of that. And it's like, don't you see? And it's not even ego-driven, but he, he just said that to me. He said, I didn't call you to speak to the nations. And he reminded me of a vision that he showed me when we moved here. And there was this, this bridge plank beam across this little stream. And it was about five feet wide, about three feet deep. And the water was crystal clear. And there was these fish. And I'd taken this loaf of bread from the other side of the pond in the dream, I had this loaf of bread, and everybody was fishing, and they had all these gadgets and all this junk, and they were all fishing. Their lines were crossing each other, and they had little spinner wheels, and they had all this stuff hanging off their hats, lures hanging off their hats. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I just picked up this loaf of bread, and I walked around to the other side of the pond where there wasn't anybody. And I was standing on this bridge, and there was this stream. And according to whatever size fish that was, I would just break off a piece of that bread and drop it to that fish. And I'm washing that trailer out the other day, and he showed me that again. He said, I never called you to speak to the nations. I just need you to feed the fish that are in front of you. I just need you to take the loaf of bread, the Word of God, the living Word of God, that's what it is. And I just need you to break off whatever piece, according to the size they are, or where they're at in their walk, and just drop it to them. That's me. I'm, I'm just trying to be honest with everybody so everybody knows my heart. I love it when somebody sticks up for me when I'm not there. And somebody's trying to talk crap or something and they say, you just don't know them. That's all you need to say to anybody. For some reason recently it's all stirred up again about something. I don't even know what because nobody will tell me. <laughs> That's neat. Are you with me? Or are you against me? That's what else he said to me. You know, Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. And that's the other thing he said to me in the trailer. He said, you know, you can say that too. I said, I can? He said, yeah. Because they're either for you or against you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's, not, it's about me fulfilling my purpose and you fulfilling your purpose. I just want every one of you to know in here, I'm for you. That's it. I'm not against you. I'm for you. I'm not for your stuff. I'm not for your notoriety. I'm not for your ego. I'm not for, I'm for you. I want you to be whole first. I want you to be happy. I want you to have a good marriage. I want you to be healthy. 
spiritually, physically, relationally, financially. I want you to be whole. That's it. I'm for you. Are you for me? And so, I know I'm going long. We're going to be making some changes because there's a lot of things have changed over the last 15, 13 years. And I think it's all good, good things. And we're going to be making some changes, some structure changes in our, and even the government of the church and stuff. I, I still want to have this meeting. I'm just trying to decide when's the best time to have a meeting to talk about the financial situation of the church, go over our last year's finances and things like that. We're going to put them on the screen. I, we're, we're as plain as there is. We have nothing not to show. Um, and that, and explain, because a lot of people, we have these rumors going around, we don't have a board, we don't have this, we don't have that. i got three boards. Three. I think our church has one of the best structures of government that I know of, and I've studied it a lot, been around ministry a lot. We have an interior board. We have an exterior board of elders. I have two sets of outside elders. Every decision that's made here is not made by one person. It's made by multiple people. I have a group of advisors also. There's really four. So no matter what somebody says or does, I, I, I just want you all to know. I want to make that vision clear. I want to make that, that, that purpose clear like we were talking about in one of these things. Unresolved, or I mean, um, lack of shared purpose. I want you to understand how this thing works. Who makes the decisions? Where's it go? Where's the money go? I have nothing... I, I have no reason not to. I just get lax because I just assume everybody knows we're going the same direction, what we're about. We had no salary change for 10 years. 32000 a year for 10 years. Our church grew 800%. If that was a company, that'd be a big deal. I think it's a big deal for a church in this town and this size. And so I want you to see that stuff. I want you to see the things that God did. This building is paid for. We paid $65,000 to our city and county in taxes that we shouldn't have had to pay. But we paid them because God instructed us to and because people were faithful. We're here for the good of the community, not just the church. Amen? Amen. God was wanting to show the community that the church doesn't have to just take and not pay, not be involved, that the church can get involved. I'm proud of you guys. I'm proud of what God's done here. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, man. Of what could be done. So, I don't know. Let me ask you guys, what would be better if we just did a full-blown Sunday morning time like this and do it then or another time? Because I'd like to share this stuff. I want everybody to be clear and everybody to be on the same page. Any suggestions? I'll do it on Sunday and I'll put it online. I don't care. I put pretty much on there right now. Because I have nothing to hide about anything. You can let me know. Anyway, stand with me. We'll pray. I think if we could get unity in every area of our life, it would just be way more powerful. Let me just sum it up like that. Amen? I'm so excited about some of you. <laughs> I just love you. I don't know what else to say. That's it. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that we can just be real and we can 
be honest and communicate. And I'm going to do everything I can do to create unity. Keep me from allowing these things that I've listed here today um, in my life, my relationships. Help me to communicate. Help me to resolve disagreements. Help me to share purpose. Help me not to gossip. And help me not to allow incompetence in my life, I pray. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my family. Thank you for everything that you're doing. I just speak life, encouragement, peace, and joy over this place, these people. God, I thank you that in the darkest times is when the light shines the brightest. And I pray right now, God, that that light that you're turning on in all of our lives of unity will just begin to shine for you, your kingdom, and your glory. You showed us a beacon of a light that would be here. And I think it's your truth that does that. So we just give you praise today. Pray for direction, peace, wisdom, knowledge for all of us to walk out our purpose for you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, have a great week. Appreciate you.